So um, keys to translation of research results into practice. So we all agreed upon the fact that you cannot do research in a first phase and then translate it into practice, into policy in a, in a disconnected second, later phase. You got to in, um, involve the key players from the beginning. So you need to know who are the key players in government. Um, they should be on board when you submit the grant. They might be part of your grant. You should at least talk to them, even if they're not part of your grant. Um, you've got to know who these people are, get their interest, and this interest has to be genuine. You cannot just look at them as uh, people who give you money, but you need to be interacting with them for many uh, months and years, so they got to feel that. Uh, that you're interested in what they do and they will then help you reach your goals if you help them uh, if you if you figure out what the government the the ministry etc what they need from you okay so if they feel that you're going to help them achieve their goals they're going to be more likely to help you achieve your research goals and obtain your funding um let's see so you got to link up with government um, you might get partial funds from government also. You got to motivate them. And they might act on your behalf uh, when it comes to interacting with some key players that you don't know, uh, establishing contacts with key players that you that you you don't know. The government can act as your, um, as, as your champion, they might promote your, your research agenda and, and help you meet the, the key people. And there was an interesting point that Arnaud from Quebec made. He said that uh, when he approached government, he was on a very short timeline. So there was no time to you know, think about issues for months and months and risk that the project sort of goes uh, nowhere. But there was a very clear and very short timeline, and he felt that was very helpful. On the other hand, there was also the remark that you got to be in the right place at the right time. So uh, Arnaud also brought the example of him going to government, and they, they, they were saying, this is a great project, but it's the wrong time. Come back next year. So there's an, a, an element of, of luck and chance and serendipity. Um, so you got to be, pre be prepared with your project, with your grant submission for the right moment for it to be submitted, right? Because there might be a new grant mechanism popping up overnight next year. So don't wait too long. Get your stuff prepared and, and be ready when the right moment pops up. Um, you got to understand your environment. You got to spend lots of time, and that was emphasized by Nina Barry. You got to spend, what did you say, bucket loads of time? Where are you, Nina? Yeah. <laughs> bucket load, I like that. Buckets of time to develop those partnerships um, because you're doing participatory research. You're not just doing sort of research that is disconnected from, from um, policy making. Um, who are the key influences? Yeah, and the, the 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 most important meetings they tend to happen after the quote unquote official meetings when the men go out and have beers and play golf and that kind of thing. Um, so <laughs> you you got to understand those. You got to try to understand those mechanisms. So I have a I had a beer with a federal government sitting in the train last week, and I think that was uh, the right thing to do. We didn't play golf. <laughs> Yes, that's right. I know nothing about social media, and maybe I shouldn't say anything about that, but we had a brief discussion about, you know, what, what should your activities be on social media. So there's real advice, there's quality advice on, you know, what kind of pictures, how much content, how many words, and which social media platforms to use because different people, different age groups use different social media. But honestly, I know nothing about that because I'm too old. Uh, Margie, what did I forget? <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. So, who's next? Joanne. So, I'm going to keep referring back to my group because there's things I simply don't understand. So... Um, I think one of the issues we thought was um, 
it was very important when you're thinking about establishing research to look at the disciplines you're surrounding yourself with and you either have a multidisciplinary committee or a disciplinary board or a multidisciplinary group so that you can bring everybody in because one of the issues that we also talked about was resource and I think this goes to what our colleague from Romania was saying yesterday is about how you can mobilise resource that may not be within your if you like, organisational reach. So are there ways in which you can collaborate with academics? And there were some um, examples from the UK where there's a, collab a direct collaboration with the London School of Hygiene, but also across other places. And Laura talked about how bringing people together and finding ways of channelling other organisations into the work that you want to do so that you don't have to do everything, as it were. Um, we talked about context, how that was very important and understanding how research in one place may not be exactly right for research in another, but maybe there are some general principles that can be pulled together. Um, I've mentioned resource. Building partnerships and relationships so that any research you do do can a be informed by the real users at the end of the work um, but also be promoted by those users as well so things like um, uh, linking with your professional organizations having them as part of your advisory boards so that you are getting this uh, relationship from beginning to end um, I did think about uh, the must-should-nice <laughs> dynamic. And I guess one of the things is that we, we need to somehow find a way of moving nice, which is often how the, this kind of research is labelled, into should, and maybe moving it eventually up into must. <laughs> but that's quite a long path, and there are other things in the way, such as removing barriers, just simple barriers, access barriers, that we also have to think about when thinking about this kind of work. And I think the final thing, and this is, this is a message for everybody in the room, is about sharing success and about congratulating everybody. Um, again, from the start of the process to the end of the process, on the amazing work that people do in order to get people vaccinated. And maybe one of the things we should think about is congratulating the people who come to be vaccinated for the great work that they're doing in getting themselves vaccinated or their children vaccinated and building this protection, really, globally, not just locally. So um, is that about it? You talked about an early success. Oh, time it, yes. Yes, so where where you have an early success, promoting that so that people are then, and it's, it's part of the congratulatory right. process, so that people are energised to do more. So if something's working really well, tell everybody about it, and then they'll adopt it, and then we can tell more people about it. So it's really about disseminating success in order to achieve more. Is that it? Okay, thank you. We had, um, we didn't really get to the last one, I should start by saying that. Um, so, yes, <laughs> so thinking about, I guess, that first part of discovery and identifying um, and appreciating what is and um, thinking about some work that we'd done, I guess some of the key take homes were um, certainly the term multidisciplinary group came up for us as well, having, having different experts involved. And we talked about the compromises that can be entailed, especially with action-led research. Um, and that might be compromises between, and, and certainly and how that kind of research might not fit your kind of dispassionate randomised control trial. I sit back and be an objective researcher because 
with action research, you're right in there. Um, you're actually perhaps, you know, doing, doing it while you're, uh, you know, hoping to make a difference and then measure that difference. So um, there can be compromises there, but it might also be a matter of finding the right um, methodology that, that allows you to talk about what you did afterwards that, you know, can, can measure the changes that you've brought about. And we did talk quite a bit around um, what you seek to measure as well, you know, are we, are we seeking to measure uptake, are we seeking to measure more engagement in the community? And because of the people in the group, we did end up having quite a discussion about community engagement. But before I get to that, the one thing, final thing that came out of that kind of what have we learned from the past, um, a few of us talked about, and hopefully some of you in the room will know what I'm talking about, um, this stakeholder mapping exercise where I think on one axis is power and on the other is interest. Um, so you, I'm good, I'm hearing some yeses out there. So, um, you know, it, it could be that, um, like if you're working with a government agency or a partner that's important to you, there could be someone in government who's like a great champion of what you're doing and really excited and enthusiastic and thinks you're awesome and wants to help, but actually doesn't make the decision and control the bucket of money that you want to get your hands on. Now, there's a place for that person. And we talked about how if you're doing like a process map of what you, you know, the situation to which you're entering and what you want to achieve, that um, you, you work out when you need to plug that person in. But there's likely another person who is the, the one that does control the bucket of money. And that person is very high in the power um, axis, but maybe less so in the interest access. So then how do you move them along that interest access so they stay, or so they get more interested and become more like the other person that loves you? But also, um, hang on, what was the other one I was gonna say? Complete mental blank. Um, okay, I'll just skip that for now. So yeah, certainly trying to, um, trying to, trying to work out where people, oh, that's right. So we talked about how um, just like there are barriers to people getting vaccinated, right? And we would be trying to remove those barriers. We'd be wanting to think about removing any barriers to that really important high, in, high influence person. So I talked about a situation where um, there's someone who occupies that position on one of the grants I'm going after and we've, and we want to that, that to then seed a bigger grant. So we, me, me and the other investigators have said that if we get the small one, we're going to get in the other guy's car and go and see the big powerful guy and make a time to go to his office and actually really draw him into the project and get him, get him excited about it, which we don't have to do, but strategically that's the smart thing to do to try and move him along that interest axis so that he becomes more you know, interested in what we're doing. So then um, we... In terms of the dream, we found it difficult to um, think about the project on vaccine acceptance that leads to changes because that's a very abstract concept. So it's hard to think about what it's going to look like. So in a strange way, we actually fell into envisaging what such a project might be by talking about, because we'd been talking about community engagement, we started to talk about um, France and Switzerland and representatives from those countries said interestingly, that there wasn't much community. And the idea that, um, like in America, we heard about yesterday from Clarissa that, um, you know, people are really kind of plugged in and people were talking about the state fairs and all the opportunities you get to influence people and spread information. And what we heard from, from France and Switzerland, for example, would be that um, if someone was to come and talk about vaccination at your kid's school, you'd be like, ooh, Stop trying to tell me, you know, tell me what to do. I don't care what you did with your kid. And also that if someone um, came and knocked at your door, they'd be trying to sell you something or manipulate you. So I, I found that fascinating because I said, this is weird. These are social democratic countries where people pay high tax and they really look after each other. And I look from Australia and feel very envious that, that, um, that we don't have what they have. How is it that they don't have community? And we talked about how you know, the state kind of subsumes community in that context. So this, people are, are happy to look after each other in the abstract, but they've kind of upsourced that responsibility to the state. So the state's doing it all through generous welfare. So people are not interconnected in that way, whereas in the states, where we're told it's a very individualistic, atomised society, and, this, and people don't want the state doing it, or even if they do, it's not, because no one else wants it to. So they actually are doing it for each other. They're connecting, they're, they're building beautiful communities. So we set ourselves the challenge of, well, what would it look like to inf introduce a community kind of peer-led initiative in France? And Christine talked to us about how in the university and medical research space, 
public health is not kind of valued in that same way and there's no interest in trialling studies or anything like that because it is called kind of all in the hands of the state but the state's not really doing it either because they're top down and they're the state. So we wondered how would you seed, um, how, how and who might seed a community engagement project to get people, to get the community passionate about vaccination. And um, we, we heard from um, Michael, that's right, yeah, so Michael was talking about how um, LGBTQI support groups um, around HIV and also around human rights, I'm guessing, um, sort of started in civil society and have later been subsumed by the state as they've gained in power and recognition that this is important. And um, so we kind of, that got us to thinking of all the different agents that can actually be change agents in a society. And um, I talked about how the French people I've met here have told me about the history of the foundation and how the Maru family have actually influenced um, French public health policy in a huge way. So kind of that got me thinking about, and we were talking about policy entrepreneurship and who it takes to, to bring about these kinds of changes. Um, so around all of that, we're sort of still thinking, well, what, what would a research project look like? How would you do this? And we didn't come out with any um, huge answers, except that Clarissa um, made the important point that you sort of need to go out and assess what's there because what was interesting in our conversation is later it emerged there were these French civil society organisations, there is volunteering, there are lots of interest groups formed around activities. So there is, there is French civil society but it looks different to civil societies we would imagine it in other contexts. So that demonstrated the importance to us firstly as we've heard from others that you can't just transplant something from somewhere to somewhere else and more importantly Clarissa what was the language? of the, the, the assessing? So, can we call it just assessment? Use your mic. <laughs> um, we usually just call it an assessment or environmental scan, and we go in, and, and others have made this point too about tailing, tailoring to local communities, is the first step is before you implement is to go and assess what the structures are there, who the stakeholders are, and to really understand who, where the influence is. Um, and then you can begin to plan your program or see what elements you can integrate or adapt. Um, so I thought you did a good job of summarizing it. Thank you. So that, that's pretty much as far as we got, but it was really fun and interesting. So thank you to my group for such a great chat. And we hope you enjoyed hearing about it. Um, I don't think we tread too much new ground than um, uh, many of the things that people have sort of um, talked about already. We were thinking a little bit more about implementing programs um, in some other countries uh, and in countries maybe um, with different um, conditions and that kind of thing. So we talked about, uh, for instance, building an environment of collaboration uh, potentially before an individual project starts. So um, it's all well and good to get a grant and then, you know, or, or to be working towards a grant and for the individual researchers to be reaching out to people in government and trying to create this collaboration and asking them what they want and knowing what you kind of want to do and trying to form a project from that. But um, uh, John was talking about in America or maybe in one of your overseas projects, um, actually spending several years uh, w w doing w workshops to sort of create an integrated environment between policy and the research community so that multiple different grant opportunities could arise from that multiple different project ideas over time could come out of that with you know um, a base of collaboration that was already established. Um, so that may be something, I mean, it's a longer term, more difficult sort of cultural thing to implement, but uh, m may produce a, a, a more different studies that are, are uh, based in collaboration. Um, another lesson uh, from the US, I think, was the idea of a solution center, which um, is based in a university. So there's uh, a solution center where people from the community can actually what, call in and, and, and tell them problems that they 
have that they would like to be considered um, for research-based solutions. And so then there becomes sort of this, almost this clearinghouse of ideas that are drawn from the community or from um, you know, policy, from, from the area, which then potentially you know, uh, the solution center can help look for researchers who are um, equipped to address that, or researchers could potentially connect with the solution center uh, if they're in um, need of a project and they want it to be derived from community need. And we said maybe that's something that you could implement not necessarily just related to a university, but maybe in some environments you could connect that to uh, a government or maybe um, we were saying maybe in some cases where staff is uh, amenable to it, um, a WHO office in a country may act in some way as that kind of central place. They, they maybe have the trust of a community and the community um, practitioners or, or individuals or whatever could, could go to them with some of their concerns or problems and then researchers who uh, come into that community or who are already in that community uh, could use that as a clearinghouse again for uh, building projects that um, address a community need. Uh, we talked about making sure that you have champions in, in government and that there's trust and that you're addressing issues that the government is supportive of. Some places, uh, Brent was talking about today in his presentation and in our talk, um, you know, some governments have a set agenda and they uh, maybe aren't as open to um, people just coming in from the outside and saying we want to research this in your community. So making sure that you uh, don't just sort of swan in with, with external ideas but you build those research priorities from within the community. Um, we talked about considering different study designs, uh, so not just RCTs and, and maybe, um, you know, uh, choosing study designs that have more interactivity. I think that's sort of some of the other groups have touched on that. Group, what else did we talk about? <laughs> Any ideas? If I touched most of the stuff? Oh, great. <laughs> Brent, did you? Oh, Brent has, Brent, sorry, just. Brent has one comment. Yes, I, I, yeah, um, uh, yeah I, excellent. I think you actually, I think you did better than we did. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you pulled it together more than we did around the, um, around the table. I think uh, um, in the examples I can think of, you know, when they're, uh, they've actually taken research and put it into policy, now that I think about it, there was always some, um, long-term country-based organization that was behind that. In Uganda, it's RACI, you know, or the Medical Research Council. You know, they had people based in country with regular relations with government. You know, the, the head of the CDC program when I was there, John O'Merman, he's now in one of the head of the centers there, you know, used to have regular meetings with the Minister of Health. And they had sort of this direct pipeline, you know, here's where the research is going, let's do that. And I think that makes a big difference. And, and, and also, and, and as you said, making sure it's the government priorities. Uh, what I wanted to say, though, we didn't talk about, and I didn't hear anybody else talk about, um, but it's kind of obvious, is money. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in the, and this is different, I think, and I, I think this is a real interesting thing between the research in Europe and in North, North America and overseas. In all of the environments I've been in, the research, we come in with money. We have money, and that definitely opens doors, you know, but there's a big difference with, like, the two examples I can think of. I mean, if you come in with money as a researcher, Someplace like Uganda say, can I do this research? The government say, sure, fine, go ahead. I mean, and you know, and you'll get your research and find a fantastic, significant result, and come back to them and say, we found the result, but they've already they've hired the next guy to come in and do their research because they're bringing in also money, and you know, so it doesn't necessarily guarantee you a way in the door. Whereas in Ethiopia, you need money, but that won't necessarily get you in the door. By the time you get in the door with your money, then they'll say, you know, they're actually interested in what. So making sure the government's there. But the best way to make sure that is make sure that you, you need a trust relationship with the government, which you said. 
um, but I think trust plus money. And I, I, <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works in the US or Canada or Australia. That's, that's sure, I'll be chairing this. Yes, would you like to talk? You, uh, Jessica, you said um, uh, research designs that are more interactive, I think, you oh, said, yeah, than RCTs. I, what do you mean by that? No, yeah, good question. Uh, I think what I meant more was the sort of participatory research, not interactive. I, that word came out of my mouth, but didn't really go through my brain first. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So where you're engaging, um, uh, like uh, action, uh, good summary of action research, um, where you develop the research question with the people that are going to be uh, like sort of the participants in the research themselves. So you're the research subjects, so to speak, um, have a role in developing the question and potentially influencing the methods that you use. Then they, pr you know, produce data collaboratively with you and then potentially have a role in, in uh, analysis as well. It's much more involved in terms of the time and the direction that it goes. You can't really come in with this set research question and um, implement it, but uh, it may be, you may get more trust from that community if you kind of engage with them in that way than if you come in with trying to implement a, an RCT upon them. Is that a reasonable summary of action research? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave before anyone makes me talk more. <laughs> So, Cindy's going to prepare the next workshop, but I want to thank you all for no, your... No, c'est pour uh, le groupe. Oh, c'est pour le groupe? Pour, oui. Oh, sorry. Oh, wow. They did the PowerPoint. Oh. oh. The best team. The best team is coming. Watch out. Thank you. Take two minutes. Uh, yes. So uh, we had the aim of our workshop to identify ideas and strategies for better collaboration between researchers and the end users, so the practitioners, uh, for this research and uh, what we did. First, uh, my presentation is the wheels: a story of work and success. And uh, I allow me to present my interdisciplinary transnational team. Please rise. Please. So, okay, they're great. And uh, the wheels was based on 30 years true, hard, and passionate work of Mr. Jean Marie Cohen from France. Please give him a big, big, big. Clap. So, it's a true story and a success one. And uh, this one to be a wheel. So, imagine, I hope you will imagine. The first is the public, the public to whom we address our concern and our work and our passion. In the first are the GPs. We try to start another way of aborting a problem. So first we take the information from the GPs. We are a preparedness for an epidemic threat. It can't be flu, it can't be measles, it can't be worse, and it can't be tomorrow. So are we prepared? Are we prepared to communicate between countries? Are we prepared to share our experience? Did we know one, each other in every country to whom to address our concern? There are just a few problems. We need the investigators, the investigators to take objective data and they have enough time, means and support. After that, the researchers. How many researchers are in every country? Who is the person to whom to address? So it's like a crisis management. After that, the social market. We find the social market, and I like it, and I enjoy it every moment from the yesterday. And the communication channel. Which are the communication channel? First to first, the phone. Somebody says, uh, I give, I, I ask to have a letter, Madame Margie. I think Margie was that. With six, I want to speak with a colleague from Emory. And I ask somebody to recommend me. So we need that, that chain, the chain of trust. And after that, we can put pressure on policymakers, but not from the beginning. They don't care. If you imagine that they care, they don't. They have other opportunities to gain money. So we need the media. We need the story. And the story goes from the healthcare providers. I have a case. You have a case. Tomorrow it will an outbreak. 
So if the media has the story and we use it with brain, emotional, and embracing the science in emotion, what they are doing, our opponents, anti-vaccinists, they use emotions, negative emotion, and it's a success, yes? What we can do, we can embrace science in emotion and emotion. Can we do that? Yes, with the practitioners, because we have enough stories in the hospitals, in the private practices. So the media must be used. That means channels, connection between us and the media. If the media starts the story, the people will react. All the channel of communication will react. And the policymakers will react because they lose power. And they can afford anything, but not to lose power. So it's the story. So we make a thought analysis of our job. Strong points. We are right on time. Need bottom cheap. It's cheap to do it. It's not cost. It's just the connection. It's just the people. It's about a story about people, about how to use brain emotion and how to do facts. So what are the weakness? Communication between practitioners and researchers. None. I'm sorry, I must do that. I must say that. Once I was, two years ago, I was to the conference in Yash, and the distinguished pediatrician, uh, I, I present my research, my little research. And he said, what? He's doing here a GP. It was my own research. After that, he shows his research. It was fake. I'm sorry, but it was fake. So communication, <laughs> that's the communication try to watch me as your partner, as your colleague, because I have the practice and you're based your research on my practice. I need your research to go on, to make it better tomorrow for my patient. The patient is the common, what is connecting us. So the media connection, it's very important. You're never angry with the media. You're always available, available for media. You always say, yes, I will make an interview for you because I can translate, I can do some messages. Our messages work in every kind of society. Politicians, religion, culture, they are dumb. But the doctors, they are still trustable. And after that, discussion about vaccine and not focus on discussion, not, I'm sorry, I, I, it was a mistake, discussion about disease not just about vaccines. People are afraid of vaccines, of needles, of pain, of info, lack of information. But they are very important. They can focus if I stories them about the side effect of the disease because they love the people who are around them. So they will react. What are the opportunity international current? Everybody wants to change something and we can unite them and also the real threats of pandemics, what we will do tomorrow. Maybe England has a good system of healthcare. Maybe other countries have, but they are countries who doesn't have. And there are no borders for disease, not even borders. And it's some threats on development of some project all around the world. We need to have united project. We need to deliver the same messages and not in the less the lack of the large population education. Everybody stories about messages. Did we have the same messages around us like practitioners? Did we have the courage to affirm it every day of our work? Thank you very much. So, our team, please. I think uh, it's so so thank you all for your participation it's been quite ins inspiring if you have any uh, suggestion for speakers last year along how to translate research into policies if you have great example of success please send me an email it's no guarantee that it will be in the program but if you have suggestion on how to move to move this topic forward because I think it's really key for uh, 
the success of this group. And now moving on to the next workshop. Yes. No, so uh, I will uh, I will send you the picture uh, like uh, at the end of the event. Do not worry. <laughs> and all the picture, you know, um, like uh, next week, we will send you a link with all presentation, all webcast, authorized of course, and uh, all the picture we did during the the event. Good morning, everyone. During the break for logistical, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Rachel Green, and it's time now to the uh, MI workshop. So it's my pleasure to, to introduce Rachel. Uh, Rachel is a psychologist, and uh, she's a uh, two uh, workshop facilitator in MI, and uh, she started a psychology career. Yeah, she's a. <laughs> Uh, as a neuropsychologist, and uh, we, uh, she's training in uh, Quebec, Montreal, yeah, at Concordia University. And uh, she now become a, a practitioner of EMI since uh, more than 10 years. And uh, she's a member of the Motivational Interviewing Networks of Trainers and the Association Francophone de Diffusion de l'Entretien Motivationnel. It's more easy for me now. <laughs> Uh, and she's currently a vice president of this association. And she's also a member of various committees in both associations and has been a member of the Order of Psychologists in Quebec. So it's very uh, my pleasure to, uh, to invite Russia. I have no the pleasure to work with you, but uh, <laughs> I work with your colleagues. Avenir. Yes, yes, next time. And uh, I ask Russia to, uh, to, to make, and it's a, a very challenge, to make a workshop, in a, a three hour workshop to show you what is MI. Uh, you should be, don't uh, be an uh, expert of MI after this workshop because it, it's a very a long process to, to, to have the skills and to use the skills. But I think after this workshop, you will get, have a good idea of what I MI is, what, what MI is not, too. And, uh, and maybe to, for further studies, uh, to use MI, it will be very helpful. So uh, thanks, Rachel, to be with us. And, uh, Let's go. Oh. So thanks. Um, it's wonderful to be here on many levels. I'd like to actually um, draw your attention to this poem, which is something that I found and I've been using in trainings a long time because it's just so, such a beautiful description to me of what we do in our lives. So, um, let's see if I can figure this little fella out. Up and down, all right. No, it didn't work, how about that? All right, so um, why don't people do what we tell them to? Uh, anybody have kids? <laughs> anybody using the taser method? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So. Um, how can we help people to change? And when you look in your toolbox for something to help people change, what do you find? What have you got in your toolbox? This is not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Speak up. Yelling, yelling, yeah. Reward. Reward. Persuasion. persuasion. And what is persuasion anyway? What does that, in, yeah, what does that entail? I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the expert role, perhaps, yeah. Sharing options. And the right, so giving information. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Right. And how's that working for you? <laughs> if you listen, it works. it works. Okay. How about the rest of y'all? Mm -hmm. eh. Reasoning, information. How's it work? 
Yeah, yeah, right. Kind of iffy. Yes? Understanding where the person is at. So if you kind of tune in to where they're at on something, mm -hmm. kind of going from there to, to try and move them forward. Sure. Sometimes that's very helpful. Yeah. I'm, in fact, all the time it's very helpful, basically. Uh, even with kids, especially with teenagers. Um, not that I have two teenagers. Well, one of them's past that now. He's 21. So I'm out of there. Uh, although he was easy. No, it was great, actually. Um, but what I want to say about this is, is information is so important, right? But if information was everything, then no one on this planet over four years old would smoke a cigarette ever. It's not for lack of information. There isn't anybody alive on this planet who can read, who is somewhere, and not even if you can read. I mean, basically, this is general knowledge now that cigarette smoking is bad for you. And I still see young people smoking, and it just astonishes me, right? So it's not knowledge that is important. I mean, it is important, but it's not enough. It's not enough. So am I, for me, was that tool in my toolbox that was not there and now is there to help people meet, move people towards change? It is in its entire reason for being. Yes, well, that was the wrong thing. How about that? So what I wanted to say about vaccination, you can all read this. I don't need to read this to you. Um, 20 years ago, well, first of all, I did my research in head injury, but I was almost derailed to do it in autism. So I have an interest. I have a, a speech pathologist mother and an audiologist father. Word geek, research geek. I'm like, oh, it's genetic. So I was really attracted to autism, but I was always ha already halfway through my project and suicidal, but you know, I figured I'd go through because I'd already sort of started. Um, so I've always had an interest, and then I had a kid, and it was right at the heyday. It was 20 years ago, right at the heyday of oh, autism, MMR, oh my God. And I had personally had a very bad reaction to my MMR when I got it when I was uh, 15 or something. So I'm like, eh. So what I did was I read the research, it was pretty iffy, but I kind of felt, well, you know what, I'm not going to vaccinate now. I'm going to wait until they're a little older, their immune system's a little bigger and more uh, stronger, and then I'm going to vaccinate. So I did that and he had no reaction whatsoever, he was fine, blah, blah, blah. And then I watched the research evolve. And then we roll it forward and I got an invitation to come here to talk to you. And I got to hear about Alno's work, which is utterly fascinating and fabulous. And I'm so proud of Quebec because most of the time I'm very frustrated with Quebec about MI and other things. But I don't think it's Quebec that's so fabulous. I have a feeling it's Arno, but you know. So that's why I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really thrilled to be here because it's really part of some, some piece of my big interest uh, connects to it. So um, moving on, I just want to say, if your cell phones are on, I invite you to turn them off. Because you've all worked your brains like to craziness, right? So this is a chance to connect to your heart. And I have noticed that there is no app for this on your phone. So I'm going to invite you to dial that down and um, see if you can just participate for a little bit. Uh, you've got some handouts that I just handed out. The presentation is more or less what I expected it to because I, you know, just adjusted it this morning. Um, <laughs> and the handouts are, are actually, uh, there's an informational piece and there's also a worksheet that we're going to use uh, in an exercise in the afternoon. And here's how you can reach me. Uh, I also have cards if you ever need one. Just come up and ask. I've got a pocket full of them and you're welcome to that. I do travel. Uh, I've been all over the place and I give workshops in French and English because I'm luckily uh, I've been trained to do that. <laughs> so I want to ask you how you feel about change yourself, personally. How do you feel about change? Now, who loves change? All right, we got a few people. Whoa, this is a very highly changing group. I love that. That's very cool. Usually you get about 1% to 10%, but this is much higher. Okay, so what do you like about change? And what helps you change? New experiences. So you like the new experiences. So the novelty helps you change. Yeah, what else? Possibilities. Possibilities. So again, what could happen next? 
Right, cool. All right, what else? Getting better. So some improvement. You want to see some improvement or know that there's a possible improvement before you're ready to throw yourself in. Mm -hmm. What else? Excitement about the unknown. Excitement about the unknown. So that helps you move on too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Necessity. Necessity. Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's imposed on you because it's a necessity, how do you feel about that? Does that help or not help? Resentful. <laughs> some of us feel resentful. Yeah. Sometimes it helps, sometimes not so much. Yeah, yeah. So if you're asked about it before it's imposed on you, how do you feel about that? Like if you have some input, not real, not fake asking, like, hey, would you like to change? If you don't, you're gonna lose your job. That's not real asking, okay? <laughs> We're clear on that? But could you help me design this so that this change works for you? Would that help you? So this is a sort of a normal kind of paradigm where change is easier if we're included in the change, if we're active agents in the change, even if we're kind of scared about it. Yeah. Also, I think um, trust. So, you know, when someone says to me, look, I, I need this thing to change. Right. Um, how, oh, I should use this. Uh, I need this. If someone says to me, I need this thing to change and trusts me that I care enough about them and the environment and you know they, they provide me with the reasons why it's a good change for them and then kind of ask me either for my help or so asking for a favor there's some really nice research but asking for a favor generates a, a stronger connection than sure. doing a favor yeah. um, but if they ask me for help and ask me how they can help me help them then you know that's a situation where I think change is made much easier rather than that like we're going to change how are we going to do it <laughs> right and that brings up a couple things one is trust but it can't be one way so you have to trust the person who's talking to you and they have to trust that you can do it and they have to convey that trust because just having it is not not good enough all right and, and so when they give me some of their power then i trust them more Power sharing, right. really important. Okay, so I want to tell you about something that happened to me a few years ago. I was listening to National Public Radio, and I listened to a little interview with Brendan Nyan, whom I'm sure you've all heard of, and you've probably read his research. No? Okay, he's an epidemiologist who uh, usually works in political thought and was somehow uh, invited or hijacked into vaccination, did a, a couple of vi vaccination studies that were quite interesting with somebody else and his name escapes me. Somebody Jason knows it. Reifler? Say? Jason Reifler? Je yeah, Jason Reifler. Anyhow, I heard this and he was, he was, tr he was stymied by the fact that the information did not change people's mm. practice. It changed people's minds. It opened their minds, but the practice stayed the same about vaccination. And what he had done was another study in politics, and he found that if you did a sort of a self-actualization uh, activity, it changed the activity of the person as well. So just not just the mind, but the behavior. So I, uh, having learned MI, we have a way of giving information, which I'm going to teach you a little bit later. And I thought, oh, well, this little piece of that is really that self-actualization. And I've always had this hypothesis. And then I was invited to do this. And I thought, you know, maybe I should contact Bra um, Brandon and see what he has to say about this. So I sent him an email figuring, you know, eventually I might, if I'm really lucky, here before I get here. 30 seconds later, in my inbox was an answer. It was fantastic. And he actually led me a little bit farther forward with where he was with that and, and some other researchers have continued. And what they found was, in fact, this self-actualization thing did not work. It was not because of that. But his current working hypothesis is that the relationship between the person, this goes back to the trust thing, relationship between the person who is asking somebody to do something that they don't really want to do, and that person is really the thing that makes that transfer <coughs> possible. So again, I look back at the way we give information in MI, and I see that that one aspect that I thought was self-actualization, which is, uh, it's really actually sharing power, um, is also part of engaging the client or the patient in a therapeutic relationship. And even if you go beyond therapeutic relationship, in a, it engages that person in his or her own process. And it shares the power in that respect. 
Because very often, p- helping professionals all do all the work, all the heavy lifting is on our shoulders, and it's a big mistake because we can't make people do things because they don't give us tasers and because tasers are unethical, even if they did. So we don't go that route, and we just work, and we convince, and we push, and we give them information and more information, and it still doesn't move people unless they're already so close to change, it doesn't matter if you're reading the phone book. So we think, oh, if I really push hard, it works because some people change. But those people have already done the work towards change, and you're just kind of flicking them over the edge. And literally, you could read the phone book and say, look, if I read you the phone book, you're going to do this. And they say, oh, yeah, for sure. So that ain't it. That's what the research says. So here's the, here's the activity about MI, and here's the interesting part where we engage people. And we engage them by giving them power in the whole conversation. So, how long does change take? Think about something you wanted to change in your lifetime, in your real life. How long, just pop it out right, right here, how long did it take you? Or how long have you been thinking about it and you still haven't done it? Couple years. Couple years. What you got? Anybody shorter, anybody longer? Pick one thing. Pick one thing in your life and just tell me. Exercise. Yeah. So how long did it take you? You started thinking about it. How long did it take you to put it in action? Oh, about a month. A month. Okay. So we've got a couple of years, a month. Anybody else? Doesn't matter what it is. A lifetime? <laughs> okay. I'll know we're going to talk later. <laughs> what else? What else? How long does it take you to make a change? I mean, some people have been thinking about something and they're still thinking. I, I think it depends. No, no, just pick a change that you're trying to make. Oh, How long okay. have you been thinking? Yes, of course, it depends on what it is, blah, blah, blah. Well, I but. tend to try and change my environment because I know I can't change my behavior, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, we, can, we can talk about that. Right. <laughs> so how long does it take? Sometimes, sometimes it's immediately and sometimes... The first day you thought about it, you did it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Minute, I about it, I Excellent. So you have from one minute to many years, Four and to months. never yet, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're getting somebody in our office, and we expect them to change like that. How about that? How likely is that? Well, could be in the moment, or it could not. So here's what's great about MI. We're not actually expecting the change. We are preparing a person to change then they do it or not, okay? So that's the, that's the setup. Here's today's objection, objections. <laughs> no, that was, a, that was a, an error there. Ob- objectives. So I want to talk about how it might be useful to you um, and give you a definition a little bit about the values and the spirit. And this is just a taste because a, a, a basic workshop is two or three days. And even after that, there's lots to learn. I'm still learning about this process. Offer a chance to play. So we're going to do some actual interaction with each other. Um, and uh, hopefully pick your uh, interest in learning more about it. All right, so the first thing is how do we see our patients? Sometimes we see them like that problem. And sometimes we see them like a well. In MI, we try to not really be too much in the problem-solving mind until much, much later and try to use our gently curious mind. And instead of looking at our clients as problems, we could look at them as resources, as the place to go for how they work and what is their preferred way of learning, what works for them. Rather than assume all that role of responsibility, we're going to get it from the other person. And it really requires a mind shift because our brains, which are wonderful, our problem-solving brains. So we have to kind of down, dial that down, dial up our gentle curiosity. And it has to be gentle and it has to be non-judgmental. This is really tough when you're trying to bring something forward that you totally believe in. And these people that you're talking to totally don't believe in it. So you have to struggle with that. It's really an interesting struggle to watch yourself get into. So if we can think about these people as resources, we're going to be better off. So I have convinced Margie to come up and do a a role play with me because I thought it might be easier for you to understand what this looks like if you see what it looks like. 
And I will admit right now that we're going to take a pause at some point, no doubt, because I don't have all the information Margie has about vaccinations and the current status thereof. But that part is not the interesting part because, in fact, motivational interviewing is a little bit like this beautifully shaped bottle in which you could put just about anything that fits through the little hole or even anything if you smash it up so you can get it in. And the idea is that the bottle stays the same, but what goes in is different. So right now, motivational interviewing is used in 28 different domains, you know, from uh, the, uh, the um, um, oh, brain jam, the, um, mm, well, smoking cessation, but also the, the um, the criminal, cri criminal justice uh, uh, department and, or justice or injustice, depending on where you come from, um, from, uh, from uh, post-cardiac care to uh, substance misuse writ large, et cetera, et cetera. So we can use it in many ways because it is a way to help people change. Doesn't matter what you're changing, it's a process that we can engage in change. Education, for instance. All right, so Margie, if you would come up. Um, what do you think? Are we going to do this with, uh, with handheld in so chairs right here? Are we standing? Yeah. No, I think we're going to sit. Yeah. We don't have two of these. I thought we did. Oh, there's one here. So you get this one, which is already on. Okay. Good? Yeah. All right, so Margie's gonna play the role of a real client that she knows who is coming in not pro-vaccination, so is not really interested. And I'm gonna try to have a helpful conversation with her, okay? Hi, Margie. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to have a conversation about vaccination with me. Sure. Okay, so can I ask you right off the bat, what do you know about vaccination? Would you talk to me about that, please? Well, it's funny you ask me that because I've actually just had a baby and I've been thinking a little bit about it and I am very worried about vaccination. And I know that kids, babies are given vaccines, but I think that there are just too many vaccines given and so I'm quite worried about it. So you're concerned um, about too many vaccines. Talk a little bit more about that, would you? I mean, my baby's so little and so small and so, you know, I, I just am worried that va uh, babies are given too many vaccines when they're too young and that their, their body, their immune system just can't deal with the number of vaccines that they're given. Mm -hmm. So you've heard somewhere that this is an issue. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I, I'm, I see all the time uh, problems that babies have, um, reactions, and, you know, I speak about it with my friends, and I, I'm just really aware that vaccines are, uh, can be quite dangerous for young babies and can be quite toxic, and so I'm really thinking at this point that I probably will only start giving vaccines when my baby's about two. Okay. So what do you know about the time frame for giving, giving vaccines? Well, I know that I was offered the birth hep B vaccine in the hospital, which I said no to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they told me the next time is around six weeks um, when I will be thinking about giving vaccines mm -hmm. to Matilda. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm, I'm really not sure. As I said, I'm thinking I'm going to delay them. Right. Okay. Um, so you've already been thinking a lot about this, and this is really helpful. So I'm wondering if you would be interested in receiving the newest, freshest information we have about vaccines and the sort of rollout and why that rollout is like that. Would that be interesting to you? Well, I've read quite a lot of stuff. Um, I could look at some more information. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate your openness about that. So now I would just take a pause and I'd give her all the great information that Margie actually has. Okay. So presume that we've just gone through that in a nice slow pace with little stops and you know checking in to make sure she's taking it in. And then I'm going to say, so given all that new information, how does that change the way you're looking at vaccinations if it changes it at all for you? Well, I'm still worried that about you know the ingredients in the vaccine. So I can see you've told me what vaccines Matilda needs to have at six weeks, but. I'm still worried about what's in them and what effect they might have on her and that, you know, they might hurt her, might be toxic. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So you're a mom who wants to do the very best for her child. Yeah. And you, I've just told you all about, you know, all the ingredients and the, the effects that they can have and they, and, and some of the research about the numbers that we have, right? So there is a, a tiny percentage of a possibility that something goes wrong, very small. There is a larger uh, percentage of, of possibility that um, your child gets the disease if they're not vaccinated. And again, in there, there's a possibility that they get very ill because some of these diseases are really, really terrible for kids. And you're faced with a dilemma. As yeah. a good mom, what's the best decision? Well, you see, the thing is we really have a great diet and lifestyle in our family and we're all incredibly healthy and, you know, me and my husband, we really don't get sick. And so I'm thinking, you know, if we have... If we stay healthy and we eat really good foods, that Matilda just won't get these diseases. Like, I just don't think she'll get sick. So you're really loading your life in the positive to keep her safe because it's really important to you. That's right. And, I mean, I think if, if, we, if we are healthy, she'll be healthy. She won't get the diseases. I don't need to protect her. Right. Has, and, and what's your plan for Matilda in terms of school and, and, and moving forward as she grows up? Well, I'm thinking she'll be homeschooled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. And and she's going to not play with other kids. Well, she might play with other kids, but in our community, you know, um, we we all, you know, we, we have similar beliefs about things, and and we're all right. really healthy, and so she can play with the kids in our community. Right. Because um, you think the risk is really low. Well, the risk's low, and and I've talked about this a lot with my friends, and we all really believe that. You know, um, these diseases just won't 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 affect us because right. we're so healthy. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, um, can I ask you? Does your family move around at all? Do you travel? Do you go on vacation? Well, we uh, yeah. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that. We are thinking about going overseas um, mm -hmm. towards the end of the year. Right. Um, so, if you go overseas, I imagine you're going to be on a plane. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people on a plane. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not really clear that those folks are all vaccinated. So this no. puts you in a, a different place, a different environment, where you're not sure of what's going on with them. Yeah. And maybe they're vaccinated, maybe they're not, maybe they've been infected and are not showing any reaction yet, and you, you just don't know. So what do you do with that piece of information? How do you, how do you face up to that? Yeah, actually, I hadn't really thought about that. I guess we could not go. Mm -hmm. We could just not travel. Yeah, that that yeah that that that's a problem. So you might not travel. Yeah. So you might not travel we until might the kids are adults. Yeah, we could wait till she's two, right, and then travel. So so you're gonna get the you're gonna get the uh, the vaccinations at two. You're gonna load her up with all of them yeah. at two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So you're sure about that? So that's that's already a step towards that idea of protecting her later yeah i think that's true I, I agree that i would like to protect her but i'd like her immune system to be stronger and more able to cope with the vaccines mm. and and the ingredients so yeah I, th I i think yeah doing it later is better okay so what do you know about the development of the immune system yeah i don't really know i mean the vaccines are injected straight into the bloodstream right mm -hmm. Well, some of them are. Some of them are injected through muscle, through muscles, so intramuscular. Right. Yeah. Not through the bloodstream. I okay. mean, they get absorbed differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I thought they were injected straight into the bloodstream because it's you know the aluminium I'm really worried about going straight into my okay. baby's bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you know anything else about the immune system and and the interaction between those uh, those ingredients? Well, I'm not really sure how the immune system works. Um, I think the vaccine um, creates antibodies, but I'm not really sure how that works. Would you like to know a little bit more about that? Yeah. I really appreciate yeah. your curiosity. That's yeah. great. So then I would, of course, launch into a very brief uh, informational piece about how it really gets in and all that stuff. And I would say again at the end of that, so knowing that piece, how does that change your thoughts, if it changes it at all, in terms of vaccinating uh, Matilda? Well, actually, I think I'm going to look at some homeopathic immunizations early, okay. you know, before she's two, because they can also create those antibodies. 
Um, and I, I've actually seen this um, this doctor, Dr. Goldenberg, mm -hmm. and he has given me this panel, um, about 20 of these little drops to give Matilda. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking he's actually given me a manual as well, which I can share with you. If oh, you fantastic. Like, yeah, I'd that. love to yeah, see that. Yeah, That'd yeah. be grand. So in the manual, <laughs> it tells you about the drops that you can give her and that and that they say that it creates those antibodies so right. that's how i know about the antibodies and i'm i think that that will protect her right until okay. she's two well i'm curious about the research do you know anything about the research for those drops well dr goldenberg told me that it's really well researched mm -hmm. and that it's really you know yeah that it's the it's good it works mm -hmm. so have you seen it have you seen the research? Because I haven't. Well, I'm it's in sorry, this book he gave me, it. like yeah. this manual. But I, to be fair, I haven't read it because I really like Dr. Goldenberg. Yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I go for him for my <laughs> other, you know, he, he treats my other kids and we have, you know, homeopathic, right. um, mm -hmm. you know, powders and stuff. He sure, gives yeah. us. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so and you're I, finding I, that works really well for you. Yeah, yeah. He's Fantastic. great, right? He's, he's yeah. all over homeopathy right. and making you feel good. And, yep, yeah, so I really like him. Okay. Is there any, um, is there any interaction between uh, interaction is the wrong word let me just say is there any complementarity between the homeopathy and the um, sort of traditional medicine well homeopathy is natural right mm -hmm. so but vaccines are not natural so i don't i yeah. don't think so so you don't think they're natural no where do those antibodies come from do you know which in the, that the vaccines mm -hmm. create mm -hmm. well the body produces the antibodies but it's you know all that stuff in the vaccines that you uh -huh. inject in the bloodstream actually you said not in the bloodstream but that's injected and that you're concerned about yeah, yeah. and that's not natural right mm -hmm. but but the drops mm -hmm. the homeopathic drops oh. um dr goldenberg said they were natural okay so you're you're faced with a decision you're faced with a decision and they have as much information as we've got yeah so ultimately, the decision is yours. And as a mom who really wants to do well for her child and all her children, you're thinking that you'll just hold back and you won't travel. You'll stay in a nice little environment and, and try to keep it, you know, keep it cozy. You don't take the kids shopping or anything else. You don't actually reach out of that environment. So those children will be in that environment without any chance that any of your friends travel or bring back anything into that environment, sort of like a bubble. Well, I don't know if they'll travel. It's actually something I hadn't thought about. So that's something I could think about. Well, you know what? That's fantastic. If you're open to thinking about that, that's really great. And if you change your mind, I want to invite you to just give me a call and come back in. Because we ha the research we have, which is the best we've got right now, and it changes all the time, is that we have this plan of, of vaccinations which really seems to protect kids. And the, the, the number of children who are protected is much higher than the number of children who have a bad event because of these. And we don't see any relationship between other things like autism. There was a big scare and really oh, yeah, terrified read a lot about people. That. Yeah. Terrified people. And it's been debunked. And, you know, moving on, things change, right? Information changes. So leaving you with all of that, I'm going to just invite you to come back if you change your mind and decide that Maybe it's an okay idea to, uh, to, to vaccinate Matilda. Um, and then I would stop there. Thank you so much. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> I would stop there because my knowledge is um, underwhelming about what you have as mandates and all of that stuff, and it would be different in different places. But you can see how that would roll out. Now, what did you notice about that? that might be the same as what you're doing or different from what you do. Yeah. You had described um, using the client or patient as a, as a resource, and it was so clear that you were doing that. That was so apparent right at the beginning that you were not, um, you, you were establishing what the information was, what the setting was that you're dealing with, what her thoughts and feelings were. Right. And you weren't, that, that was what you started with. And I could just see this extraction mm -hmm. occurring. Right, because I need to know where she is. Your yeah. goal was not all of them. Pardon me? <coughs> so, yeah. You, you didn't challenge her beliefs. No. You asked her to challenge her own beliefs. Yeah. yeah and you know what? That's what MI is about. MI is non-confrontational in terms of what the practitioner is doing, but it's very confrontational about what the practitioner is inviting the person to do. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. 
summarized her statements back to her, so you yeah. sort of repeated them without uh, validating them or disagreeing with them, but just uh, brought them back up periodically. I noticed that. Right. So that's called reflective listening, empathic reflective listening, especially if I've added a little piece of what she didn't say, but what was, what was evident in her heart. We call that a complex reflection. What else did you notice? Yeah. You took your time. You know, my, my thought was, whoa, this might take 20 minutes. This might take half an hour. Which doctor has a half hour to talk about this? And the other thing was, I didn't feel that your goal was that if she walks out the door, and uh, if she changes her mind, then it's a success. And if she doesn't change her mind, it's not a success. Because usually you think, well, they're not going to stop smoking anyway. They're not going to vaccinate. They're not going to change your mind anyway. So you sort of begin the session with a feeling it's not going to work anyway. And that's not what I felt that you did. Yeah, no. I, I go in with a very hopeful uh, feeling about having a conversation. I am not really trying to get anywhere. Uh, yeah, my mandate is to get somewhere. I get that. Um, so my mandate when I do this is to provide as much information as I can so the person can make an informed decision. But there's nothing I can do in this universe that is going to make that person change. That person is going to have to integrate due to all kinds of very complex little uh, pieces. They're going to have to integrate all that and then decide, yeah, you know. I. And one of the questions I might have asked is, how will you feel about this decision if your child gets sick in six months? So that's a thought. Yeah. There were lots of invitations. There were invitations to, um, to hear information, but mm -hmm. there were also invitations to change. Mm -hmm. so, you know, subtly framed within that. But, the, it, yeah, every, but it was always an invitation, never a directive. It was, yeah. Right. Right. So I'm asking some open questions about how this person is processing this stuff. I'm inviting them to think more about it. Some of those reflections are forward moving towards change. So this is the process of it. And as I say, the content's whatever you put in it, but the process is always the same where I am trying to move the person towards making a decision clearly. In this case, I would have a mandate to direct them towards making the decision towards vaccination because that is my mandate as a practitioner because I know that that's in the best interest of the client who is the child actually and not the parent. So in this case I would be sort of really guiding her which I did without making the decision for her threatening you know whatever. I'm trying to give her that information now if I had better information I would actually have done a better job and I, I can tell you that for sure because there's stuff on that I'm kind of missing. Question? I was just to say, you, you got the with them eventually. Mm -hmm. What's in it for her? Right. Yeah. Right. Say it again. Oh, sorry. You got to the what's in it for me um, when, after the line of questioning. And finally, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's what's in it for her, it's okay, I still want to travel. Yeah. I want to go to the grocery store and have my kid maybe not touch that little bar. Right. But, you know, they got to touch a doorknob eventually to get in a some door. And just, you know, passing in the, in the air, there's all kinds of stuff, right? We know this. Legionnaire's disease passes through the air. You don't have to touch anything, right? So there's various things that we're exposed to that we have no control over. And that was just what I was trying to bring forward so that she could start to process that. Whatever decision she makes is the decision she makes. Now, I really should have probably asked that last question, which is, just, just curious, if you were to give your children vaccinations and something was to, how would you feel about that in six months? If you were to give your child, a, not give your child a vaccine, and your child gets sick, if, your child, if you're not to give the child a vaccination and your child gets sick in six months, how would you, how would you feel about that decision? That, those might be interesting questions. I would ask them both because you can't just ask them on one side. It's very hard. Nina. Um, I notice really strongly the, um, which is something I, I often notice, is the asking permission to enter into the conversation. It begins with, would it be okay if we? Yeah, and that is a question that's central to MI because it hands the power back to the client to say no. Now, I've been doing this since 2006, and I will tell you that I've had three no's. Do you know I use this many times in one conversation? And they almost always say yes. And when we discuss this, this process, which we call EPE, evoke, provide, evoke, 
I'll tell you why this happens and why each step is the way it is. But it's intentional, that question, to share power. And to, if you get the no, you just stop the process right there and go backing around and find another doorway because that door is closed. You don't want to push on it because that will shut the whole conversation down. So what do you already know about motivational interviewing? Anybody have any experience with this? I know some people have. What's at the basis of it? You got any idea? Respect. Respect is big, yeah. What else? Listening. Listening is big, yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Right, autonomy. Absolutely, agency, autonomy. We all want to be part. Okay, listen. In French, we say a prise en charge, okay? Taking charge of. When, when you go into a hospital, you go through a, a process of prise en charge, being taken control of. Now, if I am in a heart attack situation, I definitely want that. If I'm going in for a vaccination, I don't want that. How many of you want to be taken care of and fixed? Really, I mean, even if you go see a psychologist, you may come in with this fix me, fix me issue, but you might not. You might want to actually be part of that process, right? Most of us do. Why would we presume that our patients or clients are different from that? So when we come in and we're the expert and we're going to tell them what to do and we expect them to do it, if you were treated that way, you might not be so excited about that. So we're trying to shift that paradigm so that we come in with a different attitude. So here's the definition. It's a collaborative, goal-oriented style of communication. I like to think of it as a way of being with people. Okay, So I want to be with people in a collaborative way. I'm not just going to tell you what to do. I'm going to ask you what you know, how you like to do things, and I'm going to use your paradigm rather than mine. We pay particular attention to the language of change, but also the language of the status quo. So there are two kinds of language we hear about. It's called change talk and Main, uh, sustain talk. So sustain talk is anything that is a barrier to change and change talk is anything that facilitates change. What we know about these two types of, of, of uh, discourse is that sustain talk predicts non-change. So the more there is from the client, the more likely they won't change. So when you're hearing that, there are ways to respond that can shift it towards change talk. Really important to do that if you want them to change. Now, the other part is that change talk is anything that facilitates change, and surprisingly, it predicts change. But the problem here is that sustained talk is, more, is stronger than change talk. So if we hear sustained talk, we need to do more change talk to sort of counterbalance. We think it's like this to start with, but it is not. It's really balanced towards not change. So we have to lift that up, get it at least to an equilibrium, and then try to shift it so that it goes towards change. So this is the work that the practitioner has to learn to do, which means listening for that change talk and strengthening it by a reflection. So we add a little something to it. So if she says, well, I could think about that. I actually missed an opportunity there. I could have said, so you're kind of ready now to start thinking about possibly a different approach. I'm not going to go, so you're ready to get your kid vaccinated because she's going to laugh me right out of the room. So we go up by tiny increments, but we're always thinking to strengthen the change talk. But you have to really adjust your hearing aids so that you're hearing the change talk. Because especially if you go in thinking, well, this isn't going to work, right? They're not going to change. We're not listening properly. We will not have our best listening ears on, OK? So briefly, where did it come from? Bill Miller started in 83 wondering why some people succeed in um, in substance misuse programs and some don't, and started to develop this sort of component system of autonomy and personal ability to change. And then he matched up with Steve Rolnick, who's uh, in the UK, and they started to work together. First article published was by Bill in 83, and these guys are still um, strong participants in our community, which is the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, MINT. And we have an annual conference. They attend. They participate in wonderful ways, um, although they're both theory theoretically retired and very busy <laughs> somehow. So um, it's based on Carl Rogers' humanism. 
So this acceptance, this idea that the person is really okay and the person is capable of making a decision if they have all the information necessary because we can't know their story. They can. We can give them information and they're going to put it into their story and see if it changes anything. It's evidence-based and research-driven, which for a research geek like myself is critical because I didn't go into psychotherapy because I thought it was a did I just say a lot of hooey? Did you hear that? It was in here, but yeah. So I thought, in fact, that it's not hooey, but it's not strongly based on evidence. Um, so I needed something that was a little tighter, and this fit me very, very well. And it's not the trans-theoretical model, which is the stages of change, which you may or may not, not know about. Um, it, that's a theoretical model. This is a clinical model. They both were raised at the same time. So I asked Bill about it because I was asked to write a chapter and they insisted on having the trans theoretical model in there because it's MI and Abby keeps saying, no, it's not. So I, I emailed Bill and Bill said, look, tell them it's, uh, it, they're kissing cousins that never married. And I said, Bill, how do you say that in French? <laughs> So at the heart of MI, we've got the spirit, we've got four processes, and we've got the micro skills. And we're going to talk about all those pretty quickly. <laughs> this is the dance party uh, segment. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure that all of you who see clients respect them, but I also want to just underline that you need to respect yourself as well. So if you are taking on the responsibility of the client for change and for making that decision, you're hurting yourself, and I'm not for that. So think about that. Think about trying to cede some of that power and return the high emotions and the responsibility for change to the client to the patient, because that's where it lives. You can do everything under your power. As we say, you know, you can lead a horse to water, and, but you can't make them drink it. You can drown a horse, and they won't drink. If they're not ready to drink, they're not going to drink. So it's not helpful, and it's very effortful for you. So I'm going to encourage you to think about that and respecting yourself in that respect. We also have partnership. Things are going to come out in a sort of random order. I can see that. All right. I'm gonna Put them all up there. So we have the cape, or pache, depending on how you like to or organize your thoughts. Um, Bill is really big on, on these uh, acronyms, by the way. So compassion is, is fundamental, and it's prob probably, if not definitely, present in everyone who chooses the helping professions. That's why we choose them, especially if you're not a doctor who is well paid. If you're everybody else, you're not well paid, so you're not doing it for the money. And some doctors are not particularly well paid either. So it's not, it's, I'm not making a blanket statement here because in Quebec, people struggle even if they're doctors. So it's, um, it's important to understand that compassion is what drives you. Now, we often talk about compassion and empathy, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, but compassion is something you have. It's what puts you into contact with people and wanting to do helpful things. So even if you're a researcher, if you're in this kind of researcher, you're not doing it because you have an intellectual kind of curiosity about it. You want to have something happen that's good for people. I'm going to make that assumption. If, you're, if that's not the case for you, you can come and talk to me later and tell me I'm full of it. That's fine. So then we have acceptance, and that is where we go to Carl Rogers, is this unconditional regard, the belief in the ability, and the right of the other to make a good decision. Now, sometimes we don't have that belief. If we don't have that belief, it's really hard to do MI. So it's something that is your personal work. If you want to do MI, you would have to cultivate that belief and feed that and sort of dial down the belief that this isn't going to work, that there's really nothing I can do. It's a terrible feeling to feel so helpless. And to believe that you might be able to prepare somebody for change, whether they change in this moment or three years down the line, is worth doing and it's worth thinking about. And because we don't really have any evidence, because none of us is, is, is clairvoyant, unless you are, in which case I definitely want to see you uh, over lunch. That would be great. I have some questions for you. Um, for the most part, we're not. So we can't predict whether it's going to work or not. We really can't. So why would we put that story in our minds? We could take that story out and say, well, maybe it could change. That's all. Not definitely will change either. You don't have to keep that story. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine. But just open it up to the possibility that perhaps there's change that could happen here versus it ain't going to work. It might make your job a little bit easier. 
Then there's this partnership. That's the uh, pas de deux. I'm sorry about that. Don't try this with your cats. They don't articulate that way. It's like, <laughs> don't do that. They they do it once and they're not happy about it. You know, and. Um, and this is really the idea of dancing rather than wrestling. To convince somebody is very effortful on the part of the practitioner. We get very invested in it and it's really strong and we're really working hard and sweat breaks out. But if we're dancing with somebody, it's gentle and it's subtle. And again, it's our chance to let them confront themselves with incoherent ideas that they put forward, but we're not doing the, the lifting, they are. And that's part of the joy of this, uh, of this approach. I think it's actually self-protective, too, in terms of burnout and other things that are very prevalent in the helping professions. And evocation, that's this idea, really, of the well. I'm going to pull it out of you. So first, I'm going to pull from you what your experience right now is. And later, when I realize what the blockage <laughs> is, in this case, it's a belief system, I'm not going to go up against that belief system, but I'm going to explore that afterwards. I might have a conversation about when have you ever changed a belief that you held and what was that like? And then we're going to evoke from them the way they like to do things and move towards a solution that they generate. Now, if they don't have any ideas, which is sometimes the case, I mean, if I go see my neurosurgeon and he says, well, Rachel, you want a little off the side or a little off the top? I don't know. That's his expertise. And I'm going to say, you know, I really don't know. I'm going to hand this to you. And he's going to say, well, if I take a little off the side, this will happen. If I take a little off the top, then what do you think? And I'm going to say, well, definitely take it off the side because the top, I need the top. It's not working so good, but I need that top. So that would be my decision if I can make that. Now, I'm really exaggerating here, but I hear it's popular. So um, we're going to listen hard for values, for what makes people do what they do. And we're going to reflect that back. And we're going to try to stay within their values because your values are not important here. Their values are. They are your motors to help those people move forward. If you're not listening for them, they pass right by you. You don't get it. And then all about autonomy. So again, seating power any way you can. In my office, I have a box of, of pencils. I have two clipboards. I have three chairs. People choose all the time. I ask them if they want to start with the paperwork or start with the discussion because I don't care. And it's the first thing I do and they get involved in the process right there. So my, my mindset is always to involve them, to involve them, to involve them in the process. The more involved they are, the better decisions they make. The more passive they are, the less well those decisions stick. So even if they have no idea, if we give them a menu, if we say, can I offer you some ideas that has, have worked for other people? And they say yes, then we give them a menu and they choose, that's the buy-in. They will not come back to you later and say, well, that decision that you made me make didn't work. Whereas if you suggest something off the top and they haven't asked you, they're gonna come back on you if it doesn't work. And they say, well, that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. We don't wanna hear that. That's very effortful for us. But if they choose, we don't do that. We don't get that because they made the choice. So again, seating power, seating power, seating power. How's that sitting? Does that make some sense? All right. So briefly, what is compassion to you? What does that mean? Empathy mixed with kindness. Empathy mixed with kindness. That's interesting. What else? Does that work for everybody? Is that how you see it? I see it Nina? A, I see it as a recognition. You are, as I am, we're all doing the best we can with the resources we have. How's that different from empathy? Uh, empathy is an expression of my compassion. So it is different. OK. So it's different. How's that for you? Does that cover it? Is there something else, something missing? How about empathy? Same. Yeah. Empathy to me, compassion is more, there's more emotion in it. There's more, maybe kindness. I think Katie's right. Mm -hmm. Empathy for me is just a little bit more removed okay. than compassion. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, to me, empathy is always something that's a little bit self protective. Like you're being kind, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of caring for the person, but just a little bit more distant. To me, compassion's a bit closer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I had kind of the opposite sense yeah, yeah. of uh, empathy, where empathy is 
more about uh, really trying to understand the specific person in front of you, mm -hmm. whereas compassion, I would say, is more about accepting whatever person shows up. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. It's okay. Is that? Uh, to, to my mind, empathy is feeling what the other person, trying to feel what the other person is feeling, and compassion is what you do about it. So how is that definition of empathy different from sympathy? So it's, in sympathy, it's the other, but empathy is that, that you, there's a more um, sort of melding of, you're less judgmental. You don't feel sorry for the person, but you try to feel and, and align your values, at least transiently, with their values. Okay. rather than feeling sorry for them. Anybody else have a uh, need? No. I can have compassion for... Please use the microphone. Oh, sorry. Really sorry. Um, I can have compassion for, uh, you know, people who are on the news or, you know, people fleeing from Syria, but I can't have... I, I can't express a sense of empathy for them because I'm not communicating with them. Compassion for me is a, is kind of a sense of generosity um, about, you know, who we are and, and how we, we have a kind of common experience of life in the world, I guess. Okay. So one of the things that you just brought out, which is lovely, is that actually compassion is something we can judge. We either have it or we don't. Empathy is judged by whom? The other. The other. Right. And if there is no other, if there is the no exchange, then we can't tell if we're being emp empathic or not, right? So here's, here's what some smarter people have to say about this. Whoops, I just went backwards. I didn't mean that. Sorry. So this is Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a um, Vietnamese Buddhist monk who has been very big in the mindfulness um, uh, world. And he and also the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama say the same thing. It's wanting to free others from their suffering. It is this desire to do that. Whether or not we do it is not important. But to want to do it on a sort of regular basis, that is how they des de describe compassion. Now, um, Wikipedia, uh, which is, whoa, sorry, didn't mean to go past that so quickly, a as we know is, is God's truth uh, in all ways, actually supports that. So that's why I put it up. I mean, it could be totally false, but you know, no. Um, so the idea is really that we work towards helping people free themselves of their suffering or we help to free them from their suffering because that is our desire. Now, empathy is the sense of understanding the other. <laughs> Sympathy is actually walking in their shoes like for miles. So we actually in internalize their emotions, which is very heavy. And this leads to burnout as far as I'm concerned. This is not supported by the research because I still haven't gotten that grant, but that's really what I want to look at. But empathy is something that we do by virtue of stepping back from ourselves and trying to understand the other with a non-judgmental -judge attitude. So that's what we are trying to bring into that conversation that I had. I was trying to understand how she sees this world. So she sees this world as being treatable by um, homeopathy, which, whether I believe it or not, has no impact at all. And you, you couldn't tell if I liked it or not, right? I hope. Could you tell? So I'm trying really to keep my own personal side out of this altogether and just listen and understand and try to put it into her framework because otherwise I'm working against her and that's not useful. It's not, it's very effortful. Question. Yeah, but can I just ask Mike, 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 Michael to you if you're formal. You know. um, so I'm just a bit confused then uh, with an individual person, if you have compassion for that person mm -hmm. and, or you have empathy for that person, they seem very similar to me. They are similar. The compassion is why we do what we do. We want to relieve them from suffering, but right. how we do it is through empathy. Oh, okay. Okay? All right. So yep. it's the what and the how, maybe. I haven't actually put it into words like that. Thank you for that. See, I learn every day. Yeah, it's confusing to everybody. All right, so here's just a few quotes. Uh, you wouldn't think that Albert Einstein would necessarily be quoting about compassion. You might be sure that the Dalai Lama would be. And this is also uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, although sometimes it's attributed also to the Dalai Lama. I think they talk, you know. <laughs> so 
a lot of this is about selfness and being happy in the world and helping others and being a part of a greater thing. And that is what drove Bill and Steve to create Am I, really? Because these are two, I wouldn't say fully selfless, but they're pretty darn close. They really work hard to be out there for others. And they brought this to many, many, many people now. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about acceptance, which is another one of those pieces of the spirit. And I'm, I'm gonna break a little bit late because we started a little late and I'm gonna just sort of respect that. So John Lennon, whom I revere, had some things to say about that. So when we talk about acceptance, it sort of looks like this. We accept who they are and where they are. We accept their values as being their values. This is never to be confused that their behavior is good or not good. You know, I see people who are dependent on all kinds of terrible things. They never ever think that I think doing those things is good for them. They never are confused. And at the same time, they do feel that I accept them where they are with what's going on. And the thing that I know is that whatever is going on right now is going to change. It may change in a minute. It may change in an hour. It may change in a year. But it will change. Everything changes. It rises up. It hangs out for a while. And it declines. Nature of life. So I know that things will change. But in this moment, this is what is happening. This is what I accept. And that helps me connect with the other person. Unconditional regard, we just talked about that, and this accurate, empathic reflection. So they say something to me, I say it back, they correct me if I'm wrong, and I adjust my orientation. I don't ask them to adjust theirs. So that's that accuracy. Now, we're going to break here, and when we come back, we'll do a little exercise. How's that? It's lunchtime. So we're coming back at 2, I believe. Yeah? Thank you.